I'm so pleased that you're here um, to listen to Dr. Andrews speak about the doctoral project. We were really fortunate to have her here some time ago, and she was talking about APA and did a wonderful job, and we have that lecture archived. So any of you that need help in writing, some scholarly research writing tips, we've added that to all of our courses, so under the additional resources, so you'll be able to see her video. Anyway, we have a lot of exciting things that are going on in the School of Behavioral Science, and first, I wanted to just share a few of those things with you. Within the school, we've done a variety of things. One, we've incorporated the Taylor study method, and that's a way to improve our pass rates for the E triple P, as well as for people to just understand the basic concepts in psychology. We've woven the Taylor study method through 51 of our doctoral project courses. Secondly, we became very aware that we need to create a doctoral level culture. And in that spirit, we developed the President's Award for the Doctoral Project of the Year that recognizes individuals who have done outstanding research in the field of psychology. The purpose of which is to encourage high quality research and to have our learners be mindful of making a meaningful contribution to the world, to one's own community, and to the world at large. Thirdly, we're in the process of revising all of our doctoral level courses. And a letter has been sent out to all our present learners as they're progressing through their program and towards their doctoral project. We recognize the tremendous magnitude of what the doctoral project represents. In that spirit, we proudly announce our expanding curriculum resources. What we've done is reformatted and streamlined the sequence of courses. It went from three, now it's to five, and broken them into manageable sections uh, to help provide additional guidance through your project. We believe that with this additional structure in place that students will be able to not only complete this immensely important capstone to their educational program, but also will make a significant contribution to the field. Dr. Andrews is here today to discuss doctoral project and the strategies to overcome resistance, or she prefers obstacles. Um, Cal Southern has developed a step-by-step -step process to aid you in completing this major undertaking, and Dr. Andrews will discuss this process and provide specific ideas on creating and developing an exceptional doctoral project. And now, a little bit about our speaker. Dr. Andrews received her master's in psychology from United States International University in San Diego. She worked, after she received her master's, she worked in the field with young women who were both pregnant and substance abusers and provided a complete life-changing program for them. Then she went back and received her doctorate, also from USIU, United States International University, my alma mater as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she transitioned into industrial psychology, where she worked in consulting areas of strategic planning, process improvement, and leadership coaching. Dr. Andos has developed numerous psychology courses. Her experience in the US at the university level includes mentorship in statistics, research, design, family systems, drug addiction, counseling, communication, motivation, and leadership. She spent two years in Israel working for the government. And then my favorite part is she spent eight years working with young women that were orphaned in Romania and she taught them life skills so they could learn to go to this. She's provided the enough community support for them to go to school, to get careers, and um, I'm just so pleased that she did this research. It was so successful, she actually worked with young, young teenage boys as well. Additionally, she created an APA learning center for a large university here in town that we won't speak of, and she speaks <laughs> nas nationally on doctoral research, APA, and graduate level writing. She edits projects for formatting and coherence with university standards. In addition to mentoring, she currently works with heroin addicts toward recovery and finds time for her three grandchildren. So without further ado, here is Dr. Kathleen Andrews. Thank you very much, Dr. Grimes. I am glad to be here again. This is a, one of my favorite activities is to come and 
even listen to the master lecture series that you have here and then to be privileged to be asked to come and speak. You know, she, as she was reading all those things I've done, I was thinking about something and I thought, you know, it doesn't matter all those things that I've done. It, uh, don't take the place of one memory I have and that's when I finished my doctoral project. <laughs> and so, even though it was a long time ago, we won't tell you how long, uh, I do remember the feelings about that and I also remember before I got to that process and what it was like. It was like th there was this giant cloud out there and it was a nimbus cumulus cloud. That means it was all dark with rain and storms and everything because I was a, I knew it would be just a disaster and a horrible time. But I got a lot of good tips and a lot of help and so that what this is to start helping you along that process and let you see that it's not one of those nimbus cumulus clouds but a stratus cloud beautiful in the sky that has a nice shape that moves anything you want it to be. Today we're going to talk about three parts of the doctoral process. We're going to talk project. We're going to talk about the process, the content, and then a brief slide just on the timeline so you understand what is expected on how to complete the project. Within the process I want to talk about four factors. One is working and you'll see what that means. It's about working with a committee. One about developing and how you're going to develop the idea for your research. When you think of a, desert, a project you think oh my gosh, there's so many things. How does anyone come up with these great ideas? And you read a, a project and you see something that, that looks like it's totally professional and, and you wonder, how could I ever write something like that? But the truth is that the person that wrote that was just like you. And so you can do it too. Because they revised it, revised it, and revised it. <laughs> and I, won't, I can't, you're gonna hear that word and over and over in the next hour. And then we're going to also talk about the finalizing process and what that will include. When you're working with a committee, there's first of all your chair. Now this person is a mentor here at Cal Southern and this person has primary responsibility to coach you through the process. Everything goes through this person. The, you will provide all your uh, deliveries to this person and this person will then submit them to another person on your committee who is a reviewer. And this person, we have two people because it's essential that we have a peer review process of what's going on so we ensure the scholarly and academic content of what you're writing. If we had just one person, it's not peer-reviewed enough, so we have at least two. We also want to remind you that when you're working with a committee and this chair, it's not a process like it is with classes where you submit a paper and then you go on to the next paper. So you don't write a chapter and go write the next chapter. Instead, you revise receive more feedback and revise and receive more feedback and revise and cycle, cycle, cycle. <laughs> and sometimes you wonder, what am I having to do this for? This is crazy. How many times am I going to have to make changes in this? And the, the interesting thing is that, ooh, <laughs> sorry. The interesting thing is that we are d dedicated to ensuring that you have a project that is worthy that you're going to be proud of. And so that's why we actually have you continue to revise it until we are satisfied that it will meet the standards of a doctoral project. How do you do this? Wanna, let's start talking about that. You can start right now. Even if you're in a master's program and planning for your doctorate, you can start thinking about this. You don't even have to wait till you're in your doctorate program. What subject creates passion in you? What interests you? What do you enjoy studying? 
what what do you think about when you're in practice counseling with your clients what issues arise for you that you wonder about what kind of treatment would work most effectively for these people How, is, wouldn't there be a better way to do this or some kind of questions like that so you're going to focus have one general area for example I listed a few that you might be interested in these are just ones that I I kind of like and um, I thought about those for you too but this is not an, by the way in an inclusive list and not meant to be it just for you to think about to generate ideas now what do you do? You have this topic, but just if we say memory, what's memory? You know, bipolar disorder, that's huge. We don't want to have something that huge. So now what you do is you work further to narrow it down until you know the population with whom you want to work. Do you want to work with adolescents? Do you want to work with adults? Do you want to work based upon ethnicity? Do you want to work based upon grade in school? educational level, demographics, uh, uh, geographic location, uh, career history. There's just all kinds of different things that define the different populations. You want to also decide if it's about a specific treatment that you're going to do or a theory, a theoretical basis for what you will be examining. You will be developing by studying the research, and this does not mean Psychology Today or some of the other magazines you buy on the newsstand, but it means those research journals that you find in the library when you click peer reviewed. That's the ones that you need to be reading. What have they found about this topic that is interesting to you? And you know what? Where the best place to find information at is in their discussion sections they talk about future research and they give you great ideas so go into the 2010 11 and 12 and next year the <laughs> 13s and look at the newest research that's been published and look to see their ideas because that'll lead you to what still needs to be done and the gap in the research is based upon what we know and what we need to know. And your project is, seeks to fill that gap. You might also want to investigate if there's some psychosocial educational material missing. An example of that is someone is going to write a, a training program for a specific population of people. And, and implement that in her school district. And that's one of my students now. And after you have this topic, you're gonna form a question, a research question. And I'm gonna come back to that under the content. And the gap in research that I mentioned is because, uh, I need to repeat this because this is actually where you spend a lot of time. You spend a lot of time reading research to study what has been done, understand what needs to be known, because what your project is needs to be original, original work that is going to contribute to the field, not just answer a question, but answer a question that can be used professionally. You will create a bridge from the known to the unknown, and that will be the answer to your research question. You will also, as the, along the way, I encourage you strongly to be maintaining an annotated bibliography. Even in your classes, when you come across articles that you really found interesting and fascinating and research that's important, keep track of that because that helps you when you get to the stage where you're actually writing a literature review. You already have a basis to which you can go. Format your references in APA, and if you don't know that, go listen to my talk on APA. <laughs> and then you'll provide a short synopsis of the article. And this does not mean that you write down everything that they did. 
but it me or who where they came from what university they were with or anything like that it just means write what they found what was the results of the research they conducted that's the important part how is what they found important to your topic use only scholarly peer-reviewed sources and when you are doing your doctoral project and you actually deliver an annotated bibliography at that point you're going to have about 50 to 60 sources but that's not enough you'll still find more than that for your final dissertation your final dissertation will have probably close to 100 sources if not more you will provide a foundation this annotated bibliography will help you write your full literature review which actually is an entire chapter in your doctoral project and it's in lengthwise it's the longest chapter so it's very very important and that's why I encourage you to start looking now even if you change topics and subjects it gets you in the habit and the process of doing this and that's why I encourage you to do it now and here's my slide on revising Revise, 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 revise. And that is my message. Some students really come in thinking that they're going to write a paper, submit it, I'm going to give them a grade, and they're going to go on. And it is not like that. We want, you know how when I give you back a paper and I give you comments on it and tell you things you could do better, and you say, oh, okay, I'll do that next time? Well, the next time is that time. So you would have to correct <laughs> that and get that paper to me because you know what else happens? The next time I read that paper, I see other things. So now I'm going to send it back to you now with other things that I didn't see the first time. So that's why there's a, a cycle here. But it's like if you were publishing an article with an editor, the editor would do the same thing. So we're, we want it to be perfect. And a, a, we want you to be very proud of it when you look back at that bound document sitting on your shelf when you show your children and grandchildren. Because this is the culmination of the highest standard of academic achievement. This is the highest level you can get with a doctorate degree. And that's why we want it to be uh, revised, 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 revised. And what do you do after all these revisions? <laughs> You complete the final edits with your ch from the chairperson. Then your reviewer is going to provide you comments. Oh, no, not more. Yes, more. Incorporate those comments. They won't be like rewrite the whole entire thing, but it will be comments to help you even make it better because the chair was just one person and this is another person. And then you'll receive feedback from the dean Dr. Grimes on formatting and she will help you make sure that it looks like the standard that Cal Southern wants it to have. And you will incorporate these final changes. Yes, this word says final changes. <laughs> <laughs> and so there is a goal, there is an end here to, and you will then develop a PowerPoint presentation. This is for the defense. <gasps> What do you mean the defense? Well, the defense sounds much scarier than it is. I don't want to tell you this where it's out loud in, in public, so just keep this a secret, okay? The defense is not, we're not there to fail you, okay? As you've worked with us, that's why we ask you to revise, 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 because we want you to be able to sail through the defense with confidence, knowing that you are actually the expert on this topic. You're the one that even knows more than we know at this point. And so we're not asking you to uh, come into it without preparation because we don't let you into the process until we are confident that you are the expert. And then you, if there are changes, because sometimes there are still minor changes, maybe we want you to move some little paragraph somewhere or something like that, you will incorporate those final, final <laughs> defense changes. And at that point, you're done. <laughs> but what have you created? 
that's the next question. So what do we have? We have five chapters in a presentation. Let's look at each chapter. Chapter one has these components. And please remember, it has to have all of these components. Besides being an APA format, using APA headers, each of these need to be a specific section of the introduction. This is all listed, by the way, you don't need to write it down. It's all listed in the doctoral handbook. And so that you have access to it on, this, on the resource page. The background of the problem tells just kind of an introduction to what's going on, why there's something out there that needs to be studied, and then you have a specific, it, it sometimes a statement of the problem. And this is where you can sometimes give a lot of statistics or give some background, uh, uh, concrete substantiation to the exact problem that you're going to be focusing on. The purpose of the study is a, a few statements. It's not a large section because the purpose needs to be clearly defined. And within the purpose must come the research question or questions that you are asking. Then you provide the theoretical framework and you explain why this is important. You're, it's not just a study to go see why that tree grows an inch a year, <laughs> you know. I mean, what does that mean to life, you know? Maybe it means something to environmentalists, I don't know, but not to our field. So you wanna under explain what's important to the field of psychology. And then the scope of the study, how far this extends, and your definition of terms. You wanna make sure that your research question, this is a specifics on this and the reason I'm hitting specifically on the research question is this is probably one of the hardest parts for this for learners is forming your ideas into one specific narrow focused measurable answerable research question and it is in the form of a question and I'm going to show you some examples this is not philosophical it needs to be concrete. It can't be, uh, is it nature versus nurture that's more important in the behavior of mankind, or humankind, excuse me. We, w that's not gonna be answerable. So you want to get something that is very focused and has specifics for a population and itemizes the field of inquiry as I mentioned in the process section. Reading the question creates the understanding of what you will generate as your answer. And your answer in chapter three, I mean chapter four, has to be specifically addressing this question. You may have more than one question too, if you would like. Here's a couple of examples. What treatment modalities have been found to be beneficial in the treatment of adolescent bipolar symptomology? Okay, so it, de it concretely defines the population, their adolescence with bipolarism. It's looking at the treatment of these symptoms. Okay, it's not looking at how well they do in school, how well they do, but it's the symptomology that's defined in the DSM and it's what treatment modalities have been found to be beneficial. And you will also then find ones that have not been beneficial and you'll talk about those. How have early preschool intervention strategies benefited youth by the time they reach high school? This is a, a debatable um, issue even today and that's why I listed it actually is, is it really helping the high-risk youths if we put them into pr early preschool intervention programs. You can know that it helps them by the t when they go to kindergarten, but is there a difference when they get into high school? And if you want to do this one, I, I would be happy to help you. <laughs> That's because I have a two and three year old new. <laughs> Okay, then chapter two, as I said, is the largest section of your project. It is the review of literature, and I mean you are reviewing everything to do with this topic. This is where you're finding your answer. 
So of course it's very large. You will want to have very new articles, research. Why? Because research articles take a couple years to get published after the research is accomplished. And usually they started the research a couple years before that and then had to get financing and then had to do implement and then they had to wait to get published. So you probably got four years in there, three or four years since they started this project. So you want to use the newest information you can. But we don't want to forget about the landmark information. And the landmark information are the basic theoretical beginnings that of the area that you're investigating. You want to organize your information. This is really important. D use a concept map. And I, if you haven't used a concept map before, go on, on the internet and do an internet search for concept maps in literature reviews. And it will show you how to do them. They're very interesting if you're a visual, more right brain person. A, a concept map can help you a lot. If you have a hard time with outlines, this might be a method for you to use. An outline is what I like, <laughs> but I'm more left brain than um, whoops, left brain than right brain, but I don't know my right from my left. <laughs> um, so I like an outline. But an outline, whichever method you use, you categorize your topics. Your lit review is not your annotated bibliography with the APA references just taken out, where you summarize article by article by article. It's interwoven story. It, it's how you answer your question. You can do a historical basis first and develop it over that, or themes of different treatment modality types, or different theories that have been used in this place. Whatever the topics are that come out, but that's what you want to use to organize your review of your literature. Please use APA style headers so that you help the reader, who is your chair, understand the organization of your literature review. It's, it's vital that you do it from the very beginning. And if you have a concept map or an outline, that actually gives you your headers. And then you will generate drafts of those sections while you also, I, am, I promise you, you will be very happy if you c continue to maintain your APA throughout it. Don't wait to the end, but keep all your citations right there. And then what do you do after that? Uh-oh. Yes, revise, revise, revise. Here you go again. And this is, again, the big picture of what happens again with another chapter. Chapter three is where you talk about how you were going to, or how you did, find your answer. What assumptions did you make? What limitations were, did, were experienced in this study? What barriers did you run into in finding even a broader, more accurate answer? And then in chapter four is where you actually answer your question or questions. There's not a lot of discussion here. It's very precise. This is actually a pretty short chapter because if you ha only have one question and one answer, then it's going to be short. I mean, I don't mean it's like two sentences, but uh, it's a short chapter. You want to specifically address the answer. If your question was, what treatment modalities are beneficial, you will say, the treatment mo modalities that have been found beneficial are la 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 la, and you will discuss those a couple paragraphs each or something like that, and it will be very obvious the answer to your question. The, one more chapter. Oh, I forgot to say revise, revise, revise. <laughs> okay, but it's not that much in chapter four because that's just your answer. So that's an easy one. Oh, it's just getting to it that's a little tough. Chapter five is the summary. And this is actually where you get a talk, okay? This is where you get to explain what you found that is beneficial to the field. How is your answer going to help the field of psychology? That's where your recommendations come in. And you want to be able to discuss ideas for future research. 
what else can be done now? Taken this information that's been found, what could the next people do? And the example to see this is actually found in many research, most research articles, I mean everyone that I have read, has this kind of information and then you'll see it modeled there so you'll know what to do. And then you're going to finalize your document. What's the end part of your document? Your references and your appendices, if you have any. You might not have any, but you might. Um, very large tables or figures are sometimes put in appendices if they are larger than a page um, because it's uh, um, formatted more accurately. And then what do you do? Uh-oh. Yeah. This is sort of it. Proofread it, edit, revise, and repeat. And I got tired of saying revise. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you got the message and you understand what it means. After you have done that, and I mentioned the presentation, and I want to spend just another minute on that. You, this is conducted in person right here. You can, you can be right here in front of us talking, which is really very, I encourage you to do that, if at all possible, to come to campus to do it because it makes it r a little more real and a little just more, I don't know, I, I don't even know the word. It's, I don't want to say fun because it's not really fun. <laughs> <laughs> but then I get to meet you, so that I guess is fun. Okay, so come on in person if you can. If you can't, we'll hold it like this today that we're doing with video teleconference and we will watch your presentation like you're watching mine. You'll have bulleted PowerPoint slides just like mine. You will not have sentences in PowerPoints. It'll be a very professional appearance, not only of your presentation, but also f of yourself. Your mannerisms and your presentation style should be very professional. It's not an informal presentation, but a very formal presentation. Your part of it lasts about 15 minutes. And so that doesn't mean that you get to go over every single piece of your literature review because it would take much longer than 15 minutes. And the primary audience you're speaking to is your chair, the reviewer, and the dean, who have already read at least once, if not many, many times, your project. So that's why it can only be a 15-minute presentation, but you have to hit the main points, the question, and answer the question, because that's what you will get questions on from the committee. And if there are other people in the audience, they might ask questions also. Then you will be asked to step away, whether you're on video teleconference or in person. You will ask to leave the room, and the committee consults to determine the results. If there, I hear a giggle in the back. I, you, I don't know what that is. Okay. <laughs> and then the consultation. The committee will consult and then you will come back in and we will tell you the results. Yes, m most of the time it is, we congratulate you on, re on your dissertation, I mean your project, and we congratulate you on completing your doctoral work. Um, usually we have, but we would like you to change this one thing or two things, but then you can change it that night and you're finished. So don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. <laughs> How do you get this done? Okay. My goodness. Okay. Now, I want you to notice on this slide, I put estimated. Okay. All right. Because the course is geared for one session, which is eight weeks, it's estimated eight weeks. But please don't lock yourself into that plan be able to take an extension if you need to take an extension. Because remember, it's the culmination of your academic career. This is what you're proud of. This is your crowning achievement. The one that I think takes, could take longer is chapter two, uh, that you would want to maybe be prepared to do an extension in. However, and that's if you have a good question already prepared when you come into chapter one. If you come into the dissertation or pro doctoral project 
process without an idea and a focus area, it'll take you a few weeks just to get that generated. And so come into it prepared, and that's why I encouraged you to start working on it now. It's not really chapter one in those eight weeks. It's chapter one starting now, okay? Get your ideas and your, your topics chosen now. Even if you want to email me ideas, you know, and ask me questions or something. What do you think about this idea? You can do it. Maybe you're in your second class and you want to ask a question about a potential topic area. That would be fine. I would be happy to have you do that. But then w after the fifth class, you actually have graduation. Yes, it does come. And when it happens and you get to walk on stage and have that doctoral hood put on you by Dr. Grimes, it is a moment you will never forget. And I really, although I encouraged you to come in person to the doctoral defense, I cannot encourage you enough to come in person to graduation because even if you miss a bachelor's degree or a master's degree graduation, you don't want to miss the hood being put on. It's just something that you just never forget, no matter how old you get. <laughs> okay, I'm ready for questions. Great, thank you very much. I'll start off with a question or two from the virtual audience and let our in-person audience gather their thoughts. Uh, first question comes from a uh, 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 a learner on, from the East Coast. Are doctoral projects based on qualitative or quantitative research? Actually, that's a very good question. And the, the truth is that we're not asking you to do actual research project where you go out and conduct a study. You can do that if, it's, if you really want to do that. But you can also answer it based upon the literature that you find. So it depends on what you want to do. I would say that the type of study that we're asking you to do is actually a qualitative study because it's analyzing the research that's out there. But we don't ask you to actually code the data and do that um, as you would in typical data analysis. And uh, here's a question I'm particularly interested in. I, I came from a law background and we would do we would, uh, research uh, for law journals. And a problem that would arise is when you're in an area that's, that's very, concurrently very hot and you run the risk of, in, in, in our case, cases refuting or narrowing the research that you're relying on in, in, in your particular paper or project. Does that happen in the psychology realm? What, what if you're in an area that's very hot and there's a lot of current research being conducted and during the course of your project, uh -huh. You're seeing, uh, what's your advice to handle that sort of situation? That if someone you, else answers it? Well, either answers it or discredits some of the research that you're relying on. If you're in a really hot area of study where there's okay. a lot of related research happening. At first I thought he meant hot temperature. And oh. <laughs> it's been really hot uh, here, so it made yeah. sense to me. If so. you're in an area where extensive <laughs> research is being done, multiple research okay. projects that <laughs> might affect the research that you're relying upon, what's your, is there a strategy other yes, than? Yes, you incorporate it pick a new topic. Oh, yeah. No, you don't need to do that. You incorporate it as part of your project. If there's new research, you incorporate it. I mean, that's part of what happens when you're working on a research project. That's wha why you want to start with the newest research ideas that you can and not take something someone wrote. Even in 2006, you don't want to go back and do something that someone thought of in 2006 without making sure in all the literature you can find, no one's done that yet. Mm -hmm. Are there any tricks or strategies to making yourself aware of whether there's uh, current, uh, pending research in that, that might affect key things that you're relying upon? You, you can look at the government grants that are out there right. in research, but Private university research is usually not published before it's out there. Okay, sorry, they're coming in as we speak here. Is it accept acceptable to incorporate actual case studies, for example, from uh, 
from professional or consulting work into the results? That's a great question. I actually had a student do that. She uh, w was in another country and wrote about the gender differences in the field of psychology and included in that a case study of clients that she had and, and as support for her information. Yes, she, she did it, and I, and, and it was okay. <laughs> I forgot to add that part. <laughs> she did it, and I told her to, no. <laughs> okay, a student asks your advice, uh, wondering if they might do a very limited study with a thorough research review. As, can you do a very limited study with a thorough research review as well? My idea involves not only a question of current practices with regard to criminal evaluation, but I want to study the possibility of contributing something new to the criminal evaluation process. I'm not sure what limited means, so that's a little bit catch-all. That's kind of a term that I would be afraid to answer when I don't really know what's being thought of, because limited to you might be, not be mm -hmm. limited to me. Great. Any questions from our Sorry. audience here? You, yes. you may have answered it in the very oh, beginning. Just one second, please. Oh, sorry. You may have answered it in the very beginning. I may not have caught it. But the, uh, your chair and the reviewer, is that chosen by the learner or is that chosen for you? It's chosen for you. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Dr. Grimes assigns those chairs based upon um, the workload of, uh, of the mentors, making sure they have time to work with you and um, coach you along the way. And she also wants to make sure that there's someone who has an interest in that area. Great. Thank you. I have two questions. I'm uh -oh. in the School of Business. And I'm wondering uh, how long, in your experience, uh, Kate, is the length of the dissertation? If your your work is different than yeah. than the psychology work, my experience with what you guys are required to do is two years. Now, now when you say two years, I, I mean the for length, the the, for number, the, 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 the the number of total pages. Oh, the length. The length of the dissertation. Oh, yes. oh 150. Okay. And I mean, I, I don't think it should be less than that. I, I actually had a student uh, last year submit a 450 page one, yeah. <laughs> but I didn't read it more than once. <laughs> <laughs> now, 150 sounds reasonable. I was okay. in that ballpark. Too. Okay. And then, secondarily, uh, I like to have uh, communication with the committee uh -huh. and find out if the intangible traits, to use a psychological term possibly, are compatible. Uh, with and, the and chairperson? The chairperson uh -huh. and also the reviewers. And if uh, a qualified uh, student has any concerns whatsoever, I guess the school allows you to take those concerns up with the dean. Sure. So you can work everything out. Because I, I think it would be better not to get locked in. You have to have a, an agreeable environment which, and a supportive environment to do this. The, the person also has to perform. So I'm, it's yes. Anyway, that, uh, yeah. Sorry. So, so that's uh, my last question. And my answer to that is, uh, yes, you do. You may take it up with the dean. And I, but I want to encourage you that sometimes getting establishing the relationship and learning to work through issues is also part of the doctoral process. So the dean can help you with that and you also are responsible to work that out with your chair. Because it's not a matter of, okay, I had a disagreement or I don't like all these revisions or I don't want to do this or the, the, cha the chair's not letting me move forward. Those kinds of things are not going to be enough of a reason to get someone to change your chair. You've got to, if you want to change a chair, it has to be very, very adamantly something disrespectful or very big. Um, because working with the chair doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to agree with all the changes. 
And sometimes students want to change just because they don't agree with the chair. And I wasn't referring to that. I was okay. Oh, and doesn't give enough feedback soon enough and all that? And, 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 gets, and, and gets feedback and possibly the, the person isn't available to answer questions. Okay, so let me address his question. His question is about whether the chair person gives feedback in a timely manner, is available for questions and those kinds of things. And those are big concerns and the dean would want that to be available for you. That is the yeah. chair's job and she would or, yeah, she would in our department. <laughs> I, I think and he in your department would want that to be uh, part of the process for you. We are required in the psychology department to provide feedback on anything you submit us within two weeks. So although it's a longer time than with um, dissertation, I mean with schoolwork, in, in regular papers we try to do it quicker than two weeks, but it's longer than a week because it's much more information. It's bigger than a four-page or eight-page paper. Okay, the, uh, we, we have a clarification on the earlier question. Okay. That was confusing, so that's good. And also, some others have asked the same question. So um, she is wondering if she might be able to actually do a hands-on study herself with criminals to assess this new procedure as well as reviewing the research in the field and incorporating that into her doctoral okay, work. Okay, let me address that. I, I would like to say yes, but I need to tell this learner that if you're asking to work with people who are incarcerated, you're running into huge IRB problems. And that's the Institutional Review Board because now you have people who really are not freely choosing to participate. And that can be a problem. Plus you have to have permission from all the people in that prison or jail or you know the system. And that can take you an additional, can take an additional six months or something sometimes to get IRB permission. Mm -hmm. But to the broader question and uh, another one is coming in. Taking the uh, incarceration out of it or working with the, the, uh, the correction system, can students do their own case studies and incorporate those findings into their doctoral projects? I think I answered that, yes. Okay. Uh, great, one more. Uh, with regard to organizing references, do you find it necessary or would you suggest using a software like EndNote or s similar? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can tell you didn't listen to my AP. <laughs> I do not recommend you use that because it's really easy to write a reference in APA and it's really easy to write a citation in APA for a journal and that's really all you need to know. Um, and I encourage you not to because in note whatever they make the mistakes that you put into it because it can only do it as good as you, the information you give it. 